Right, everyone. Hello. Today is Wednesday, and we are going to cover our class number eight, which is regularization. But before that, I wanted to cover uh, one more time what's uh, how can we distinguish the, what is bias, what is variance, and then what is the trade-off between the two, right? And I'm going to give you an example over the whiteboard and hope that this, this example helps you. But the big takeaway whenever you're thinking about bias versus variance or bias variance trade-off is that Think of bias variance trade off in repeated samples. It's not for one sample, it's not for one train set or test set or whatever. The bias variance trade off happens in repeated sampling. So if, you, if you're dealing with multiple train set, let's say, multiple samples, right? So let me actually give you an example. And I, I will, I'll make the case very exaggerated, but hopefully that, that uh, drives my point home. So imagine, let's see. We are in two dimension, we have an X, we have a Y. And imagine this is a true relationship. And when I say true, I mean, imagine these blue dots are the entire population. So we know that the relationship is going to be something like this. Think of the data, right? And again, this entire population is unobservable. So what do we do? We pick a sample and use that sample to train the model and fit a line, right? Let's, let's work with two, two different models. So, so the first one is going to be the very simple model and uh, it's going to be very, uh, the bias is going to be high, but the variance is going to be small. So that very simple model, I just show it with linear line, right? I know that the true, uh, the true data out there is nonlinear as everyone can see, but uh, I'm gonna pick a sample out of this blue observations and then uh, do a fit, uh, simple fitted line. And let's say this is the model, right? And this model is based on maybe this, these observations. Again, guys, I'm, I'm picking a sample from the population, right? So imagine these, this is one sample. Does everyone see that? I'm using the red dots to come up with that line. This is a very simple model, right? And now we wanna talk about the bias versus variance trade-off. And whenever I say bias variance, think of the model bias, the bias and model variance. I'm not talking about one, one parameter, not like beta head one or beta head two. I'm talking about the entire model, right? So this is my entire model, which is, I can write it down like y hat is equal to beta head zero plus beta head one x, right? I know, uh, I would say that beta head one is going to be unbiased if on average, the beta head one is equal to beta one. Right? This is what we had from econometrics. If on average, the estimated coefficient is equal to the population true, uh, true population parameter, right? But, so this is, this is the parameter, uh, when we say beta had one has a bias or not, but the bias variance trade-off that we talk about in machine learning is the model bias. So model bias is, if you think of the combination of the two, and then I can call it f, of, f hat of x, right? I wanna see if this f hat of x has bias or not. So what are the components of F hat? It has a beta hat zero and beta hat one, right? So if both of beta hat zero and beta hat one are unbiased, so it means that F hat of X is also unbiased, right? But I want you to think about intuition. So this, this red line is my F hat of X. And I'm, I'm, I claim that this model is super simple and the bias is going to be very, very high. Why? Because if I do another sampling, so let's do, I'll try to use cross. So maybe let's pick another sample from the data. I'll come up with another line, maybe like this, right? So this is this is a second, so this is my, let's call it F hat of two. Then again, if I pick another sample, maybe this is, if I pick another sample, oops, maybe this is the line. If I pick another sample, maybe this is a line, right? So I have a bunch of these F hats, right? Ba based on each sample, I come up with one F hat, right? So then at the end of the day, I take the average of all those F hats. If on average, that F hat is capturing the pattern in the entire population, you say that this model, there's, the model bias is small. But look at that. If you look at the average of F hat, it's, the average is going to be a simple line, right? So the average is not capturing the pattern, which is nonlinear. So on average, the model is off. Does that make sense? So for that reason, I say that this model has a very high bias. Are we good? So it's, it's a property in repeated sampling. So if I take the expected value of F hat, if it is equal to F of X, remember F of X comes from the blue dots for, in the population. 
If it is on average close to that pattern, I call it it's unbiased. But here we can see that in, the, in our simple model, which is a red line, the bias is high. But here, bias is very high actually. Does everyone see that? Okay, again, think of the bias as a property of repeated sampling, not one sample. You have to take the average of all those F hats and think about it that way. Now, what can you say about the variance of this red line? We call it model variance. Do you think the variance is small or large? Look at the, look at the lines. In repeated sampling, the variance is small, right? So the line is tilting a little bit, but it's not that. So on average, you're hitting at something which is off the pattern. So the bias is high, but the variance is, so on the other hand, the variance is going to be small. Does everyone see that? Why the variance is small? Because look at these red lines. Okay, so this is, when the model is super simple, we say that on average, we're missing the pattern. On average, we're missing the pattern, right? But the variance is small. So bias is high, variance is small, then the model is simple. So let me say the red ones, simple model. Yes. So for variance then, uh, we wanna look at like, if we were to do multiple samples and get multiple regression lines. Yeah then those regression lines don't vary that much this, from each other. Exactly, so low exactly. This is exactly what we are saying here, right? You see, you say that if you, if you do this repeated sampling multiple times, the slope is not going to change that much. Yes, it does change because the sample is different, but it doesn't change that much, right? So that's the idea. idea. Now, let me use the green color and the green color is going to be, and here over the right-hand side, I'm gonna write complex. It's going to be way more complex model, but we'll see what are the uh, pros and cons, right? So if I, what do I mean by complex? I say, let's do a nonlinear fit. Let's do polynomial and polynomial is able to capture this nonlinear, nonlinearity, right? And actually let's say, I'm gonna use one sample and that in one sample, I'm gonna make the model super complex, not polynomial to the power of two, polynomial to the power of 10. Right? So let's do that. If I do that, the model is going to capture, and guys, as I'm going through the blue dots, so imagine each blue dot that I'm, that I'm connecting are part of the, my new sample, right? So let's do it this way. So for example, this observation is in the sample, and I'm, I'm fitting, basically, I'm passing through all the sample data points. Does, does everyone understand? Okay. So this model is very complex, and maybe it's a polynomial to the power of 15 or 20, who knows? But as you can see, it is capturing uh, the pattern for, for one sample. Now, let me do another sample, right? So let me do another of these green, uh, green ones. So maybe another sample is like this. Do you see how different they are? So right away, what do you think of the variance of these green lines? The variance is going to be very high, right? Very good. So the variance of F hat of X is going to be very high. But remember, this is, we are repeating this process thousands of times, repeated sampling. Let me do it here. Okay, is it on? Uh, yep. So is it fair to think of this as, okay, speaking of bias, we are looking at the, we're, we're comparing the model to the sample data. Okay, and if the model uh, does well in, in, in fitting the line through the sample data, then we say it has a low bias. On average, so, average. so you just stay with me. This is exactly what I'm covering here, right? So look at these green curves. So you just told me that the variance is going to be high because for each sample, it's going to be completely different thing, right? But look at the average. Does everyone see that on average, you're capturing the pattern? So this is what we call the bias is small. On average, we are hitting at a target. So on average, we are, we are capturing the pattern. So the bias is going to be small, but the variance is high. Because the variance, again, remember, look at these green curves. So the first green curve was way off than the second one, way off than the third one. But on average, if you take the average on, the, on expectation, it's capturing the, uh, the pattern, pattern in the data. So this is what, we, uh, what I mean by the bias variance trade-off. So always think of it as the property of repeated sampling. It's not for one sample. Does that make sense now?
So when I, for example, when we see, uh, I'm gonna post this one later, but uh, when you see a data like this in, on the slides that we say, okay, this is, this model is complex, the bias is small. So you should realize that yes, the bias is small, but the variance is going to be high because on average, if I do these things thousands of times, on average it's capturing the relationship, but the variance of that line is going to be high depending on what sample you're, you're working with. Yep, Brian. So, does that answer your question, Abraham? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Ryan. So we want, like, ideally, we want to try and have as low bias, but preferably lower variance. Yeah, that's that's our ideal work. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You want to have zero bias, zero variance. That's that's awesome, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, so we are uh, on the two end of spectrum, right? So for example, when the model is simple, as we said, the bias is high. So let's say this is bias, this is complexity. The model is simple, the bias is very, actually this is bias square because we, we wanna look at the mean squared error. The bias square uh, decrease as the model become more complex and the variance increase as the model and I want you to think of this, this is the bias of F hat of X and the variance of F hat of X, the bias of the model, entire model and the, and the variance of the entire model, not one variable. So in, in econometric, we look at the bias and variance for the one beta hat, but here we're looking at the entire thing, just combine them all together, right? So we call it model bias and model variance. Does that help? Okay. All right, so uh, now, actually this is a very good segue to our, to, discussion for today, which is penalized regression or regularization concept, right? So uh, let me minimize this one and start the slides. Uh, very good question. So the plan is for today, I'm gonna cover all the slides. So today is going to be basically theory. So I'm gonna cover all the slides. And at the end of the day, I made a slide, uh, I call it the students questions. So that's, that's where, where, I, where I'm going to answer your question with your help. Okay. All right. So regularization, or we also call it penalized regression. And, and we, we look at the most uh, maybe com commonly used penalized regression forms, uh, namely ridge regression, lasso regression, and uh, elastic net regression. But uh, let's actually look, look at the visualization first and then we'll, we'll go over the definition. So as you can see on the right-hand side, the bias is going to be small because on average, you're, hit, you're hitting at the target. So if you, so the more precise way of thinking of this is that there are multiple of these things. On average, you're hitting at the target. So the bias is small, but the variance is high. So we call it overfitting and we are in this, uh, on the right-hand side of this graph, right? But if the model is super simple, on average, we're way off the pattern of the, in the data. So the bias is going to be super high, but the variance is small because we are completely, well, this, we are always taking the average. In this, in this example, we are always taking the average of y, right? So this is underfitting. And as we said, so the bias is square, this is the red line and the variance, right? So what, what is the idea of regularization? What is penalized regression? So we, we also call it penalized regression. The idea is very simple, very, very simple. Uh, basically, we want to reduce the complexity of the model. And we hope that as we reduce the complexity, guys remember, here is complexity. As we are reducing the complexity, this bias is going to increase a little bit. That makes sense, right? Because I'm making the model more simple. On average, we are not heading at a target. But we hope that this small amount of bias that we, I just added is going to be balanced by this amount of variance, which is reduced. Does everyone see that? So this is, this is the whole point of doing regularization. Again, we hope that if I add a little bit of bias to the model, I know which is not a good thing, but on the other hand, if that little bias helps me to reduce the variance a ton, that overall the mean squared error is going to, remember this is bias square plus variance, uh, plus some irreducible part. So let's, let's ignore that one. So if I'm adding bias a little bit on purpose, and I hope that the variance is going to shrink a lot more, that overall the NSE of the model is going to decrease. So that, that's the whole point of regularization, basically restricting the model, make the model less complex, make the model, you can think of it more interpretable. 
Okay. So th this is the idea. The idea is very straightforward. And now let's see how, how we can do that, how actually machine does that, what, what's behind the scene, right? So, so in, in practice, well, in theory, it's very easy to understand what's, what's happening, but let, let's see in practice uh, what's, what's happening behind the scene. What is the method? How, how does the machine do that actually? So in order to do that, we have to define some terms to make sure that we are on the same page in terms of terminology. And then we will talk about the loss function and the changes that we do in the loss function. And that way the machine is able to basically penalize uh, your regression. Okay, in mathematics, the norm of a vector is its length. Have you heard the term norm? So just think of, whenever you hear norm, think of it as a length, right? And uh, you're gonna see that in classification, we look at the, uh, we think of it as a distance between points, right? So for example, if I have point A here and point B here, there are different ways that I can go from A to B, right? So there are different ways that I can calculate the distance between A and B, right? So you can, so maybe some of you guys may say, okay, this is, this is a distance, right? The distance between A and B. If you, think, if you think of distance between two points, the length of the vector AB like this, we call it L2 norm. L2 stands for L, letter L and two, L2. We also call it Euclidean distance. And that L2 norm is basically the sum of squares. Right? If, you sum, if you add the squares, we call it L2. And so look at that. You know that if it is a b, what is a, what is the distance? It's going c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared. So so the sum of the squares that we, we, we use them a lot in regression analysis is L two norm. So in regression analysis, we have been using L two norm without being told, right? So because that that's the definition of sum of squares. So if you uh, there there are also different ways to go from point A to B, right? Let me use maybe if I can see another color. Well, let's let's do it. I can I can do something like this. I can go up, and then go right. I define the distance between A and B is, let's call it, I don't know, A1 plus B1. This is another metric, right? So I, I can, you know, as a, as a mathematician, I can define uh, the distance between two points in any way that I want, right? And I can go up, right, up, right, and then up and then right, right? If we, if we go from A to B like this, not diagonal, we call it L1 norm. And L1 norm, we also call it Manhattan norm. And if you want to think about it, you know, it's, it's the city of Manhattan. For example, you want to go from point A to B, you cannot go cross diagonal, right? It doesn't make sense to go through the buildings. So you have to go one block left, one block up and things. So that's why it's called Manhattan norm, right? But, but, but basically the idea of norm is that you want to, you want to calculate the length of a vector, vector, right? Now in regression analysis, uh, how do we define this vector? This vector is going to be the vector of our errors, right? So in regression analysis, we need to, a measure of mismatch, right? So this, what, are the, what is the measure of mismatch? Remember guys, this is my Y and this is my Y hat. We also, we know that this is called epsilon or residuals. At the end of the day, whenever you wanna come up with this Y hat, this regression line, you need to somehow calculate the length of these errors. Is everyone with me? Does that make sense? Now, how do we define the length of these errors? We said that you cannot simply add them up because if you simply add them up, what do you get? Zero. So you can either take the uh, absolute value and then add them up. So this is what we call uh, Manhattan norm or L1 norm, okay? Least absolute error. So this is in regression analysis, we call it least absolute error or this is the second one, L2 norm. This is something that you, all of you guys are familiar. We covered this one. You know, in regression analysis, what is our loss function? We're minimizing the sum of the squares of errors, right? So maybe you didn't know, you haven't realized, but in, in simple regression analysis, you were using L2 norm for your loss function. So now does everyone understand what is norm? What is L? So we have L1, L2, L max, and different, different type, types of norms. But in machine learning, we're gonna revisit these norms later on for, for other models whenever we wanna calculate the distance between two points or two observations in the data. Uh, but uh, mostly we are gonna work with um, L2 and L1. Yeah, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see some other examples down the road. Okay. Now let's talk about the regularization itself. So, so the, the definition of it. So in machine learning, there are often many features and uh, I'm talking about 
hundreds or thousands of features, right? So it's not only 10 explanatory variables, we are talking about hundreds of them. And if you have 100 explanatory variables in the model, there's a good chance that they are highly correlated, right? So in finance, think of the, I don't know, uh, the returns, excess returns from one hand and the factors from the other hand. Factors are very, very highly correlated with each other. So in general, uh, in machine learning, we deal with many features and they're usually highly correlated. And if they're very correlated, in, there's a good chance that it will overfit, right? So it, will, it can lead to overfitting. And models are unnecessarily complex. So regularization, as we, show, as, as we saw in that visualization, the idea is to force the learning algorithm, right? So the machine is going to be forced. Force the learning algorithm to build a less complex model in a hope that the bias increase a little bit, but the variance decrease a lot, right? So, so this, is, this is the whole, the whole point of uh, regularization. And, uh, and as you can see, this blue line is a non-regularized model and the regularized version is a green one. You're basically shrinking, you, know, you can think of the regularization as shrinking the coefficients as well. So imagine this, the, the blue line is a polynomial uh, regression model, which uh, it has x, 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 x square, x cubed, x4, and maybe the coefficient of x5 is so high, that's why it's, it's going up and down, up and down. Now, if you shrink that coefficient, make it from 10 to 0 0.001, so basically you're, you're getting rid of that x5 effect in the, in the model. Does that make sense? So basically you're making the model less complex and you hope that by doing this, uh, you're adding a little bit of bias, but you're, uh, in return, you're getting a, a lot of reduction in variance. You hope that, right? So, so we don't know, we have to uh, um, throw the data in the model and see uh, if, if the model was successful or not. All right, so we, all, we already talked about L1 and L2. These are the two most widely used types of regularization. And the idea is simple, we, uh, we basically talked about it. We modify the loss function by adding a penalized term. We also call it shrinkage term, uh, the, whose value is higher when the model is more complex. So this is our, this is our new loss function. So ignore these penalty terms. We also call it shrinkage. So if I ignore the penalty terms, what is it? This is simple linear regression model, right? You're minimizing the sum of squares or minimizing uh, MSC, mean squared error. And that's basically minimizing the sum of the squared version of the errors, Y minus Y hat, okay? Now we are adding a penalty term. Again, we also call it shrinkage term. What does that penalty term uh, depend on? It depends, it's a function of weights. In regression language, beta, so beta one, beta two. And this means that if I increase the, uh, actually, if I increase this W, what will happen? The penalty is going to increase. Does everyone see that? Because you're adding, so if I add more explanatory variable to the model, what will happen to W? So if I had only two Ws now, I have three of them. So eventually, it's, and we're gonna look at, we're gonna open up that penalty. If it is L1, L2, it's a, it's a positive term because you wanna, you wanna penalize the, uh, uh, the loss function. Uh, so the penalty term is going to increase, but what will happen to, to this term? What do you think? If I add more, if I make the model more complex, what will happen to the, to the first term? Does it increase or decrease? Intuitively think about it. Don't look at the equations, just intuitively think about it. If you make the model more complex, what will happen to your errors in the train set? It will decrease, right? So it will decrease. Now, at the end of the day, you will see which, which effect is dominance. If, you know, if the penalty increased too much, the, model, the machine decides not to add that W to the model. But if the variance decreased too much, not the variance, sorry. If, if the, uh, this, the first term decreased a lot, the model decided, you know what? Let's add this W. Let's make the model more complex. It was worth it. Is everyone following? So what's the logic? And uh, in the next slide, I just wanted to show you that we also call the regulariz regularization, regularization, penalized regression as well. The idea is exactly the same. So penalized regression, we have three types of penalized regression, uh, which is ridge regression, lasso, and elastic net. Okay. And uh, it can be used to avoid overfitting and uh, I think we already talked about the first two points, but this one is important. To use the penalized regression or regularization in general, your first task is to standardize all the variables, okay? Some people only standardize the feature, maybe, I mean, the X variables, but it's, it's, it's a good idea to standardize everything that you have, both Y and X variables, right? 
And standardization, there are many ways to do that, but the, the, the simplest one is, as you remember, for example, if X is my random variable, you need to take the average out and divide it by standard error. So this is called normalization, right? Standardization. So this, this is a very common one. We have mean max and standard scalar, uh, but the best one that works in practice is uh, simple normalization. Basically, you take the average out divided by standard error. Okay. And why do we need to do that? Think about it. So imagine, uh, imagine we are regressing wage on a bunch of variables, right? So the first one is education. The second one is, I don't know, working hours and et cetera. And for some reason, for, you know, as a researcher, you want to see what's the effect of every minute uh, extra work on your wage, right? For some reason, the unit is minutes. So this one, the unit is minute. This one, the unit is year. And maybe wage is dollars. Now, if I say that, okay, if I want to look at what's the effect of education on, uh, on wage, say if education increased by one year, well, what will happen to the wage, right? So maybe, maybe that effect is, you know, the magnitude is in terms of $100. Uh, if, imagine this is monthly wage, let's say $1,000, right? For each one year of it, $100 was fine, I guess. $100 extra for monthly income for every additional education year. Educa Does that make sense? Okay. Now, so this beta, what's the scale is order of 100. Okay. But what about the beta hat two? If, if the working hours increase by one minute, so what will happen to, to your monthly wage? Maybe one minute has only the effect is cents, right? So it's not, it's not in terms of hundreds. So it's maybe it's only 0 0.01. Now think about it that the shrinkage methods, the, the penalized regression, at the end of the day, they're going to reduce the magnitude of this hundred and then 0.1. It's not fair to compare these two variables with each other. Does that make sense? So we have to standardize, we have to scale all the features first. And then when you look at the betas, you can compare the betas. So in regression analysis, we call it scaled regression. We didn't cover it in econometrics, but basically the idea is very simple. And interpretation changes slightly and says that, for example, if working hours increase by one standard deviation, what will happen to wage? Not one unit, the unit is going to be standard deviation now, right? But uh, on the plus side, now beta had one, beta had two, the scales are normalized. And when the penalized regression is going to shrink them down, it makes sense. Okay, so that's why we have to standardize our features before doing, uh, before changing the loss function, right? Before dealing with the rigid lasso on uh, elastic nets. Are we good so far? All right. And the only difference between these three models is in the loss function, in the penalty term, right? So the, depending on how you define the penalty term, you will get different models, right? So the first one, if I, if I use L2 for the penalty, I call it ridge regression. If I use L1, I call it lasso. If I use a combination of L1 and L2, I call it elastic net, right? So you should uh, remember what was L1, what is L2, and uh, the combination of two is basically it's a weighted average of the two, right? So let's start with the ridge regression. So the first one, again, we're gonna use exactly the same loss function. This is, we are minimizing the MSE plus some penalty. The first model, uh, which is ridge regression, the penalty term is L2, L2 norm. So remember what was L2? Sum of squares of errors, right? So look at that. We have sum of the squares. Remember going from, what was L2? Oh, sorry. Yeah, does everyone hear me good at home? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, when you go, when you want to go from one point to the other, it's sum of the squares, right? So we are adding, we are summing the square version of the weights, sum of squares. So this is L2 norm. And we need to add one parameter. We call it shrinkage or penalized term. So this is our lambda. And uh, let me actually go over this uh, bullet points and I'll talk about it there. So ridge regression uses L2 norm. And remember L2 is sum of squares. If I go from A to B. And uh, the shrinkage penalty has the effect of shrinking the estimates of WJ towards zero. So 
we're going to talk about why it happens. It's, it's beyond the scope of this class, but I have a couple of slides that explain to you why it actually the ridge regression, the coefficients will, will converge to zero, but they're never zero. Uh, but in Lasso, we can get exactly zero. But, but for now, I just want you to realize that whenever we are talking about the ridge regression, the effect is that these Ws are going to decrease. So maybe W1, W2, W3 are going to decrease, but they never go to zero. So they never go to zero, okay, in ridge regression because we are using L2 norm. And again, I'm gonna do, give you a visualization, explain why, but bear with me because I need to explain what is less so and then come back to this question, right? But for now, just remember that the shrinkage uh, effect is reducing this W towards zero. And again, why are we doing that? Because we wanna make our complex model more simple in hope that the bias increase a little bit and the variance decrease a lot, okay? And uh, yeah, the tuning parameter, this is our, uh, or shrinkage parameter or penalized parameter, whatever you call it, the tuning parameter lambda. This is, this serves as a, to control the relative impact of the penalty term on the regression coefficient estimate, right? So if I increase the lambda intuitively, what will happen? So if this lambda increase, this is a positive term, right? So if it means that the right-hand side, this part is going to increase. Look at your optimization problem. You're trying to minimize something. It's a bad thing. So if the lambda increase, uh, your, your right-hand side is going to increase when you know that it's, it's a bad thing. So what the model tries to do, the model tries to get rid of these Ws. The machine tries to get rid of those Ws to reduce, to, to minimize this loss function. Okay, so as you increase the lambda, basically you're telling the model be more restrict, regularize more strongly get rid of more variables because those variables, you know, look at that, the WIs are going to hurt the model, hurt, hurt the loss function. Does that make sense? Yep, Brian. Can you just explain what the Ws are again? The Ws are uh, beta one, beta two, beta three. These are the weights of the features. Oh, okay. okay. This is my Y, this is my X, W1. Uh, two dimension, three dimension, whatever. Okay, so these are, these are simply the weights of the features. So W1 in this example is the weight of my X. Coefficient of education, coefficient of age. All right, so selecting a good value of lambda is critical and we're gonna use cross-validation for this purpose. Because uh, I think we are all familiar with the, uh, why we do cross-validation because you wanna use the train data, but to get a sense of the performance of the model in the test data. So you use cross-validation to estimate that number, right? And uh, on the other hand, you, don't, you wanna make sure that the test data is not leaked into the model, right? So the model at the end of the day is trained on the train set. The regularization, Abraham, to your question, the regularization is, all, is always done on the train set, okay? And then we figure out what are the, uh, what are the optimal values for Ws and et cetera. And we, we test the model that we look at the performance metrics uh, as before. The performance metrics are going to be exactly the same. We have R square, we have MSC, we have, so that, that's something separate from the loss function, okay? So that's why we have to do cross-validation. Again, if, if you wanna find the lambda using the train set, it's nonsense because it's not a good proxy for the performance of the model in the test set. So that's why you have to do cross-validation. And uh, it is best to apply ridge regression after variable, uh, variable standardization. So uh, for ridge, less so elastic net, for the reason that I talked, just talked about, we should do uh, standardization first and then do regularization. If the, if the magnitude of your variables are kind of the same, you don't need to do the standardization. But if the magnitudes are different, so it's, it's going to be a lot better if you do standardization. Okay, so that was our first model of ridge regression. Yep. Question. So uh, regularization through the ridge regression method are you are you getting rid of the uh, are you are you scaling back the coefficients or yes. are you getting rid of the variables? Very good point. The first one. Okay. You're scaling down the coefficient. This is the picture. Okay. So very good point. So Abraham says that in ridge regression, are we getting rid of variables or are we scaling down? The answer is we are scaling down. Okay. And guys, in the polynomial regression class, do you remember that I was sitting as a god? I told you that I know the true model. The true model was this, x plus two x square minus three x cubed plus some noise. And actually in next class that you're doing in Python, you're gonna revisit that. And you're gonna use rich and less so and elastic net and see which one is 
more able to capture that, right? But look at this one. So imagine I'm imposing this functional form. I'm saying that the functional form that I'm imposing is polynomial to degree of five, right? Wx, W1x, W1x2, W1x3, so W3x3, W4x4, and W5x5. Is everyone following? This is what I am imposing as a researcher, right? So I'm, I'm assuming a functional form. So this is, this is a parametric model, right? And now I'm gonna use ridge regression. So what you see here, guys, this is, these are the X's. And X1 is X, X2 is X squared, X3 is X to the power of three and et cetera. Does everyone see that? I have five variables here, X1 through X5. And X5 means that X to the power of five, okay? Now I do ridge regression and I set the lambda and in Python, we call it alpha. So in Python, the, the, the hyperparameter is, by the way, this lambda is the hyperparameter. I forgot to mention that. This is not a parameter. This is a hyperparameter of the model, right? Because we set it ex ante and we train the model and ex post we use cross validation to optimize this lambda, okay? So I can plot alpha versus uh, the magnitude of the coefficients. And usually you start alpha from a very small number, 10 to the power of minus three, minus four, and et cetera. And then you increase the alpha and see what will happen. If the alpha or lambda in this setup, if lambda is equal to zero, what do I get? Going back to the previous slide, if lambda here is zero, what model do I get instead of rich? Uh, no, no, completely get rid of this one. This is our simple linear regression, right? So if lambda is zero, so if lambda is zero, we get Simple linear regression, linear regression model. So linear regression means that we come up with a W1, W2, W3, W4, W5. Even though we know that the true model, there is no W3, W4 and W5. Is everybody following? Okay. So, and now as I'm increasing the alpha or lambda, I'm, I'm telling the, the machine that be more strict shrink those coefficients for me. Because for example, if I shrink the X5, the co if I shrink this W5 to something close to 0 0.001, I'm somehow getting rid of the effect of X5, but not completely. It is still there, but the effect is going to be a lot smaller. Does everyone see that? Okay, so it means that as I increase the alpha or lambda, you can see, look, look at the snapshots, the coefficients are shrinking. And everything is normalized, guys. So these, these are the normalized coefficients. Uh, everything is shrinking. See, the coefficient is shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. And if I increase the alpha so much, all of them are going to converge to zero, but they're never zero. Right? Imagine, imagine a model that here, the Ws are very close to zero. What do I get? Basically the average because I have, the, I have the intercept there, so I get the average of y hat. And just give me one second, Ryan. And so if increase the lambda, so if I say lambda or alpha, I'm talking about the same thing. If increase the lambda, basically we are, redu we are shrinking the coefficient in hope that we make the model less complex to increase the bias a little bit in hope that we can reduce the variance a lot, okay? And, and so for example, let, let's read some numbers. I'll, I'll come back to that. So let's say the, this is our, let's say the alpha is 10 to the power of uh, minus two. This is alpha. Let, let's go over W1. Let's, let's come up with Y hat. If lambda is equal to 0 0.01, 10 to the power of minus two, right? So what is Y hat? Can, can, can anyone tell me what is W1 by looking at the numbers here? What is W1? W1 is this, the coefficient is this blue line. If you look at the blue line, what is W? Look at this one. Read these numbers for me. What is W1? 0.5. Does everyone see that? So here's W1. If lambda is equal to 0 0.01. Guys, is this clear? This is important because, are we good? Okay, so I can say 0.5x. What is W2? The color is orange. So it's 0.4, it's 0.1, right? So let's say it's 0.1, roughly. So plus 0.1 x squared. What is W3? W3 is the green one, negative number, right? It's minus two. 
minus point, no, not point two, minus two x3. What is W4, the red one? Let's say point two. What is W5? The purplish one, it's 1.4-ish. Does everyone see that? So now I know that this W4 and W5 is completely off because look at that. There is no W4 and W5 in the true model. So now I'm going to increase the alpha in the hope that those terms are going to shrink a lot. And again, it's, I hope that at the end of the day, the variance of the model is going to decrease a lot more than the yeah, increasing bias that I get. So let's increase the alpha or lambda and make it to this point. So let's rewrite the model one more time. If uh, y hat for lambda is equal to 10 to the power of two. So let's quickly read the numbers. X1, I think it's around, let's say it's minus, right? It's negative. So uh, what is X2? X2 is the orange one. Uh, let's say, again, roughly speaking, 0.2. What is X3, the green one? Minus, uh, let's say, 0.2. And then X4 and X5, you get the idea, right? So X4. Let's say 0.1 x4 and x5, the purplish minus point is very close to the other one. So maybe this was too much because it's still, I don't get what I want, but maybe a good combination is somewhere around here. And by the way, this is something that we find by, by uh, cross validation. Maybe a good combination is here. I want you to erase everything and focus on the line that I just draw, this one. If I look at, and how do I know that this is a good one? So the, the machine is going to do cross-validation and figure it out uh, because in the, in the cross-validation it's come up with the smallest RMSC and et cetera. But visually, I think the lambda should be around there. But look at that, why? Because this is going to be important and it's X3 and I like it, right? And what else I have? I have X4 and X5, they're close to zero. Do you see that? And then X4, uh, yeah, X, X, X3, we talked about it. And the, this one, X2, and then finally X1. There's some positive, so I like it too. Are you following? So this is how beautiful the ridge regression is doing the job, by finding that lambda for you. And, and again, I, I repeat myself dozens of times to make sure that you understand. Increase the lambda in a hope that you're adding a little bit of bias to the model. You're making the model less complex by adding a little bias to that. In a hope that the variance of the model is going to decrease a ton and overall the MSE is going to decrease. You good? All right. But back to Abraham's points, this numbers will never be zero. So WJ will converge to zero, but it's never exactly equal to zero. Yes, Ryan. Do you just do a sensitivity table? No, you do cross oh, okay. Yeah, this is this, uh, the way, again, visually we thought we did it this way, but this is a very simplistic version. Uh, but we do cross validation to figure out what is the optimal value for that lambda. Yeah. But the cross validation is going to be a little tricky, but we we're going to talk about it in Python part next class. Okay, for now, just know that the answer is cross validation, but it's not uh, as straightforward as the one that we saw uh, last class because the your, our hyperparameter lambda here, it's continuous. So in polynomial degree it was one, two, three, four, five, but now here it's continuous. So how many of them do we want to pass it to the model? So 1.001, 1.0002 1 and et cetera, right? So for that reason, well, the good news is that the Python has some built-in functions which just do the job for us, but if you're, it's going to use a gradient descent for that cross validation, but we don't need to be worried about that. All right, so this is a ridge regression. So the rest of it is going to be super straightforward because we already talked about the basics. Now, the next one is lesso. If you look at the lesso, and it stands for least absolute shrinkage and selection operator, the way that you want to, you can distinguish between the two, always think about this L as least absolute. So when you see least absolute, you can think of this ab you know, absolute term. And then you, it should remind you of the L1 norm and L1 norm is lesso, okay? So this is the way that I, uh, let's say memorized it, but so least absolute shrinkage and selection operator. Now it's not only shrinking the parameters, we are selecting them as well. 
and let, let's talk about the feature selection property of the lesso. So the difference of lesso and ridge is in the loss function, in the penalty is part of the loss function, right? It's not W to the power of two. Now it's the absolute value of W, right? And by doing that, uh, so again, we're using L1 norm and what else? Lasso eliminates the least important features from the model. It automatically performs a type of feature selection. So the point is that the difference between ridge and lasso is that the ridge is going to shrink the coefficients towards zero, but lasso is able to fix them exactly equal to, to be zero. So if lasso says that uh, the coefficient of W4 is equal to zero, W5 is equal to zero, it's good news. It's getting rid of X4 and X5 for me, right? But ridge regression cannot do that. So that's the difference between the two. I think right now you, you, want, you may wonder, okay, why should we use ridge if lasso is better in that sense? So it comes at a cost. There's always trade-off, right? We're gonna talk about those costs later on. Uh, selecting a good lambda, again, it, it involves cross-validation. And again, I repeat myself one more time, this, why do I need to do cross-validation for, for tuning a hyperparameter in the model? Because number one, we wanna use a train set. You don't want a data to leak from test set to the model. You want to use a train set. However, you don't want to report that you, you don't want to rely on the performance metric in the train set. So that's why you do cross validation to get an estimated value for performance metrics in the test set without using the test set directly. Does that make sense? This is really, really important why we do cross validation because you do not want the test set to be leaked into the model. However, you want to come up with a performance metrics that is an estimated version of the performance metric in a test set. So that's why we do cross validation. Yep. Uh, so are you going to go over kind of how, uh, how the model is going to Oh, you, well, again, the cross validation in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the penalized regression is a little bit more tricky, but I'll talk about it in Python part next class. But for now, just know the answer is cross-validation. Okay, and again, for LISO, we have to do the variable standardization first, and then we'll, we'll do it. So here's, here's exactly the same, uh, same data set, the same true model, but look how beautifully uh, LISO is, be, uh, is able to get rid of those W4, W5 for me. Uh, so again, we can start from 10 to the power of minus three as alpha. And if you do that well, right away, it says that X, even for 10 to the power of minus three, says that X4 is irrelevant, it's zero. But still we have, what is it? We have X5, we have, let's say we have X5, we have, well guys, when I write X5, I mean W5, right? It's a coefficient of X5. We have W1, what is there? We have W2, this one is W4, and this one is W3. And again, we do cross-validation and maybe the cross-validation tells us this is the answer. Look how beautiful it does the job. So if, if this is the answer, I have W3, I have this one, the blue one, W1, and I have W2, right? X2, X3, X1. There's no sign of X4 and X5. So this is the advantage of doing less. So it's doing feature selection for me. So let's so I, I penalize the model a little bit more and then I was able to get rid of X4 and X5, which me as a god, I know that X4 and X5 are irre irrelevant. Does that make sense? So this is, this is the advantage of lasso over ridge regression, uh, which we can use it as uh, feature selection. Okay, but what's the cost? Well, I'm gonna talk about the cost of it later on. Are we good? Okay, now this is uh, both ridge and lasso versus lambda. And we talked about this uh, uh, at the beginning of the class, but as lambda increase, the model becomes simpler, right? Because you're penalizing it more. So you're basically restricting the model more. You're, you say that the model should be simpler in order to get a, uh, maybe a little more bias, but reduce the variance a ton. So as I go from left to right, the model is becoming simpler and simpler. And then this means that the bias is going to increase, but the idea is that the variance is going to decrease. Okay, so actually, let me actually do a cool exercise. Maybe if I go from, so here, you're doing a ridge regression or less so, right? If I go from, uh, let's say, plot one to plot two, 
What will happen to, bear, to, to bias? The bias is going to increase because I'm making the model simpler, but the variance is going to decrease. I think the variance is going to decrease a lot more if you go from one to two. But if I go from two to three, let's see if it is worth it or not. The bias is going to still increase, but the variance is, uh, well, the variance is going to decrease as well. Uh, but the idea is that this bias is going to increase a ton. Maybe it's not, a, maybe it's not worth it to go that, that path, right? So maybe the model is going to go to the right in terms of finding lambda. And then if it is here, it comes back. So it will basically find it here. Does that make sense? It's, again, it's a trade-off between bias and, and variance. All right, so here's a question for you. Which one is less so, which one is rich? Look at the path, look at the lambda path. Uh, and again, this is, this is very common that we sometimes we use log lambda, because if I take log of 10 to the power of minus five, it's, 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 it's a lot, it's minus five, right? Uh, yeah, so uh, let, me give them, let me label them A, B. Which one is? So what is A? Is it rich or uh, less so? Does everyone agree? So A is rich and B is less so, right? Because you can see you know, here we get, we get rid of almost all of them, but here we cannot get rid of them. The, the coefficients are go towards zero, but they're not zero. All right, so here's the answer. So the, the left one is rich, the right one is less so. Okay, now the last one, we're gonna to use the best of two words, right? a combination of lasso and rich. And as you can guess, the penalty term is a combination of lasso and rich, L1 and L2. So it's a combination of L1 norm and L2 norm, okay? So in lasso, some weights are reduced to zero, not all of them. So some weights re are reduced to zero, but the remaining ones may still be high, right? In rich, the weights are all small, but the problem is that none of them are zero. So, the idea of lasso is that, again, think of it as the best of the, uh, the both worlds. It's making some weights zero while reducing the remaining ones. So that's the idea of uh, elastic net. Is everybody following? Okay. Okay, now here comes, we are talking, let's talk about the questions that many of you guys had. Uh, so let's actually do this exercise together. Uh, and uh, here I'm comparing rich versus lasso versus elastic net. And this should answer your question that why, if elastic net is the best of two worlds, so why ever should I use rich, right? So why, why uh, lasso is not better than rich? Why elastic net is not better than both of them? So let's do this exercise together. So I, I'm gonna ask you a bunch of questions on the left and you tell me, uh, what do you expect to see? Yes or no, right? The answers are yes or no. So property is, can, uh, so this model can shrink the coefficient estimates towards zero. Tell me yes, 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 no, no, and et cetera. So for rich, yes or no? Yes. For lasso? Yes. For elastic net? Yes. yes, okay. So the second property, it can include all the features in the model even with large lambda. For rich? Yes. yes. For lasso? No. For elastic net? No, right? Very good. So this, the third one is very important and that's, that's basically why some people prefer one versus the other. Uh, can force some of the coefficient estimates to be exactly equal to zero. This means that it can be used for feature selection. This also means that it can, it can give us sparse output. Whenever you hear sparse model in, in machine learning, it means a simple model, okay? A less complex model. And more explainable, because if the model is not polynomial to the power of five, it's polynomial to the power of two, it's more explainable. Does everyone agree with that? Okay, so give me yes, yes, no, and et cetera. So rich, no, uh, lasso, elastic, there you go. Okay. Uh, the, we, we talk about that. The, the fact that we have this absolute term, we can come up with some solutions. Uh, again, it, it requires me to go over a visualization, but I, I'll talk about, so why exactly it is still able, even though it has a uh, L2 norm in it, it is still able to find L1. Yeah, okay. Exactly, yeah, I'll talk about it. Very good question. So it says that how come elastic net can come up with, uh, can force the coefficient to be zero, even if, the L2 norm is part of the penalty, sir. It's a very good question, but we, we will see that. Uh, the, the next one, is it robust? And by robust, I mean, is it resistant to outlier? 
So we haven't really talked about this one. Actually, I'm curious if you can answer this question or not. So in ridge regression, is it resistant to outliers or not? So what should I look? So remember in ridge, we are using L2. L2 is a mean squared error, right? Well, the squared version, right? So if there is an outlier, we are emphasizing that outlier a lot more. Do you remember in simple OLS, OLS is sensitive to outliers? Why? Because we are using L2 norm. You're making the errors to the power of two, you're even making it more uh, effect, more important in, in the model, right? So in ridge, is it robust, resistant to outlier? The answer is no. And less so, yes. In elastic, well, somewhere in between, right? Because, because, because exactly of that uh, uh, beta two that we have, uh, not beta two, the L2 norm that we have in the loss function. Okay, so this is crucial. No analytical solution requires gradient descent. So when I say analytical solution, it means think of the minimization problem in linear regression analysis, do you remember that we had a closed form solution? We had a beautiful closed form solution out of that minimization problem by taking derivative and et cetera. So what do you think happens in ridge regression? Think of the loss function. Is the loss function well behaved? Can I take, deriv can I, can I take derivative at every, so can I come up with a closed form solution? The answer is yes. So in ridge regression, there is analytical solution. It doesn't require gradient descent. I can, I can use gradient descent if I want, but there is a closed form solution for ridge regression. But what about lasso and elastic net? The answer is no. Why? Because we have that L1 norm and that's not differentiable. Guys, remember L1 in simplistic term, this is not differentiable, okay? And because of that, well, you see the, 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 diff, uh, the slope is not continuous, so it's not differentiable. So because of that, neither lasso nor elastic nets it can be, there, there's a closed form solution for that. So how does the machine work to figure out what are the W's? The machine has to use gradient descent. And what were the disadvantages of gradient descent? You remember, maybe there's this local minimum somewhere. Maybe the machine is stuck in the local minimum rather than a global minimum, right? So we say that this state, the path of uh, lasso and elastic is not smooth. It's going to be uh, jumpy. Now, again, in, in Python part, we're gonna look at some graphs of alpha versus the coefficient. You see that it goes up and down, so it's not stable, okay? So no, yes, yes. So again, in ridge regression, the advantage of ridge regression is that there is closed form solution. We don't need to use gradient descent. However, for lasso and elastic net, we have to use gradient descent. And again, what are the disadvantages of gradient descent? Maybe we, we're stuck in a, the local minimum, local maximum, not maximum, local minimum, local optimum, right? And it's, it's expensive. Computationally, it's very expensive, right? So what if you have millions of records and thousands of hyperparameters and thousands of parameters? It, this is going to get out of hand very quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, no, whenever we are using gradient descent, so it lasso and uh, elastic net. I, I'm saying that having a closed form solution to find the W's and uh, intercept is a good thing. Even though, remember, in simple regression, we could have used either OLS or gradient descent, but OLS was a lot faster because you don't need to try and error thousands of numbers and figure out what, what is the optimal value for W's, right? In OLS, you can get the answer because there is a formula for that. So in reach, there is a formula to figure out what, it, what are the W's. In less so in elastic net, you have to go through elast, uh, uh, gradient descent. Okay, lastly, there's always a unique solution. What do you think for ridge regression? Yes, because again, the, remember guys, the loss function is well behaved. It's the, the minimum that it gives you back is global minimum. But in less so in elastic net for exact, same reason, well, okay, in lasso, let's talk about the lasso. In lasso, because it's not well behaved, uh, you don't get a unique solution. Maybe you get this. point A, point B. If I use L2 norm, there's a unique, unique solution, right? If I use L1 norm, do you agree that there are multiple solutions? Does that make sense? So for that reason, again, the path of figuring out the W's in lasso is not stable, it's jumpy. Okay? 
you jump from one optimal to another optimal, but eventually, eventually it, uh, you will get a good number out of it. So it's not that restrictive, but you should keep in mind. And this is beyond the scope of the class. There are actually in 2005, there was a, I didn't know that honestly, there was a paper written and then they proved that mathematically for elastic net, there is a unique solution, okay. Uh, okay. And this is this is the visualization that I was talking about. So let, let me see how how many time how much time do we have? And okay, so this appendix that I put together on the slide is beyond the scope of the class, but uh, it's basically answer Ryan's question that uh, two questions actually that uh, how come the lasso is able to uh, set the W is equal to zero exactly equal to zero and the ridge regression is not able to do that right. And then based on that, we're gonna talk about that, that, the other point of yours. Okay. So this is, I, I, I picked this one from the HCT Purani textbook. If you're in, more interested to see the details, just uh, read that textbook in uh, introductory statistical learning, something like that. Uh, the textbook that I have on, the, on, the, on Canvas. And uh, basically it says that we can rewrite our minimization functions like this. And guys, this is again, beyond the scope because it has, it involves some of the convex optimization problem. But, but let's see what, what can we do. So I'm gonna say, if you remember, I had something like this in my last function, we were minimizing the MSE plus some penalty, right? And that, and so this MSE part is this, this is my Y minus Y hat, just in econometric language, right? Y minus Y hat and Y hat is a combination of beta hats, right? So this is this is the MSC part, mean squared error. Well, it's not mean because I don't have it divided by N, but it really doesn't matter, right? If I divide it by N or not, the minimization problem gives you the same answer, right? So think of it as, uh, let me actually, think of it as RSS. I hope that you realize that it, it really doesn't matter if you minimize the RSS or MSC, residual sum of square or MSC because N is constant. So this part is done. And then here, instead of writing the penalty term in the loss function, I just put it as a constraint, okay? So this is a dual, dual we call it dual version of the problem, the optimization problem. And this, if you are interested, this is convex optimization. And so basically you are minimizing here, you're minimizing a function on a convex set. And uh, that's why we call it convex optimization. And so without going over the details, basically I'm gonna tell you that you can rewrite the, the ridge regression like this, sorry, the lasso regression like this and the ridge regression like this. So this is my lasso, this is my ridge. And I think you can, you can see, I have beta hat, beta hat square and these are hat. And I have uh, beta, uh, absolute value of betas. But what does it tell me is that I'm minimizing something over a constraint. If I want to visualize them, so let's let's visualize them. So these, this is the minimization part of the least square. If you minimize the first part, you will come up with a beta hat. This is our linear model beta hat. So let's say intercept is one. I have beta hat one and two. Let's say intercept is one. Uh, slope is two. I'm just making up some numbers. Let's say two, two, right? Two, three. This is the optimal solution out of the first part of the minimization problem. Guys, remember, this minimization has two parts, minimizing the RSS and the penalty term. I rewrite it. I say, okay, minimize the RSS and subject to a constraint, okay? So minimizing the RSS part is this one. This is the optimal value. This is the optimal value, either if you use ridge or lasso, right? And what are these contours? The contours are, the points are, are, are on these contours have exactly the same RSS. So basically this RSS, let's say is 100, this RSS is, I'm making up some numbers, 50, this RSS is 20. And they, here, this single point, there's a unique solution, right? So in our linear model, there's a unique solution. Do you remember? There's one beta hat one, one beta hat two, one beta hat. So this is maybe the minimum of RSS, right? Now I have, so this is the solution to our linear model. Now, if I wanna do it in the lasso term, so I have to say, okay, minimize that thing over, over the convex sets with the, and the, our convex set is lasso. So this is not complicated guys. So it's basically, what is it? Summation of beta hat J 
is equal to one. So what is it? Beta, let's call it beta one plus beta two is equal to something, right? So that's something that depends. We can, we can, let's call it A. Can you plot this? Can you plot Y plus X is equal to Y, one? Do you remember how to plot it from your high school algebra probably? If you do that, so it's, it's Y is equal to one minus X. So this is my one minus X and then the, uh, the absolute value of Y. So this is the, this is the plot, okay? Absolute value of Y plus absolute value of X is equal to one. This is the plot. Now here we're saying that some number, some positive number, let's say delta, right? Now, the, the intersection between these two areas, so the intersection between these contours and this constraint is going to be our solution for the lasso, or here in this case, for ridge. So basically in lasso, at the end of the day, the machine is looking for numbers that beta has. Uh, the, the intersect between this constraint and the beta has that come from the linear regression, right? And as you can see, because of the shape of the, uh, the penalty, lasso penalty term, the L1, sometimes you get to the core, the, the solution can be here. And here, what is it? We have beta one is equal to zero and beta two is equal to some number, right? Let's say one. So for that reason, in lasso, you can get exact to, to the point that exactly one of the betas are zero. Okay. However, in reach, because you know, you're summing the squares of beta hat j's, let's say, let's say one. So I have beta had beta one squared plus beta two squared is equal to one. So what is it? What is guys from high school? What is x squared plus uh, y squared? This is a circle, right? And then what is the intersection between a circle and those contours? There is no corner, right? So you, we cannot, we cannot go through this line or this one or this one. There's no way that the contours are going to hit this convex, uh, the, the, this circle at the corner because there is no corner. So for that reason, Ridge does never can uh, set a coefficient is, is that exactly equal to a zero, but less so can. So this is, again, this is beyond the scope of the class, but if you are curious how, how is it possible that lasso can set the coefficient equal, exactly equal to zero, but Rich cannot, That's, this is the answer, okay? And now in the remaining five minutes, let's answer your question. So this is, these are your, I think by now we should, we should be able to answer all of them. So the first one, where does regularization happen? Is it, does it happen in the entire data set or train set? What's the answer? Train set. Uh, why the number of parameters need to be less than the number of observations? So the number of parameters, let's say I have K parameters and the number of observations I have N. So basically why I need to have K should be less than N. So we, we talked about it in the linear regression as well. Uh, why do you think that's the case? Imagine if I have 10 observations, can I, can I fit a polynomial model with degree 11? So I have 11 parameters and 10 observations. I cannot. Because you know there, there's uh, there's not going to be an answer. Uh, so again, just remember in regression analysis we had x. So the beta hat was x prime x inverse x prime y. If number of observation is less than the number of uh, number of parameters that you're estimating, this matrix is not invertible. So uh, we cannot find a solution. So for the, in order to find a solution for our regression models, we need to have the number of observation must be at least greater than uh, as the number of parameters that you're estimating, right? It's a system of equation. You cannot have more unknowns than, uh, than more, the more uh, equations. Does that make sense? Do you remember these terms from, I think, I don't know, high school algebra? Okay, so third one, isn't it better to check the multicollinearity before using penalized regression? What if lasso dropped them all? So I think this was Grayson's question and uh, it's a very good one, actually. So what, what do you think is the answer now? Well, basically he was asking, uh, what if Lasso get rid of them all? Is it possible? Well, Lasso is not going to do that. So, it's a, so let me actually set up the scene for you. He's saying that, let's say we have, let's say we have, I don't know, A plus 100, x1 minus 
80 x2. Yeah, that's let's say this is it. And x1 and x2 are very highly correlated. Let's 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 exaggerate, say equal to one. Is it possible that Lasso get rid of both of them? The answer is no. What Lasso does, remember, Lasso does both a shrinkage and getting rid of one of them, right? So it says that, do, does everyone agree that, uh, what happened? Nope, go back. Does everyone agree that I can rewrite, oh my goodness, I can rewrite this equation like this, sorry. And go, 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 go. Can I write it like this? If the correlation is exactly one? This is exactly what Lasso does. So it doesn't get rid of, even if there are multiple linearity, keeps the one which is more relevant and get rid of the others. So the net effect is going to be there. Very good question. Okay, uh, so you don't need to check multiple linearity. That's the advantage of machine learning models and the kind of statistical learning ones. Is it can, uh, it's advantage of, uh, yeah, you don't need to check this one. Uh, why bother with reach and less so if elastic net is better? We, all, we already answered this one. I think look at those comparison matrix that we talked about. How to find the optimal lambda using cross-validation. And we talked about the details of cross-validation, but the idea is clear why we need to do cross-validation, right? Is regularization useful for big data or only small sample data? Well, all we do in this class is machine learning big data, okay? So uh, yes, definitely. Uh, these, these models are designed to handle the big data because how do I know that? Because uh, we're, we're talking about feature space which has thousands or millions of variables. Hear me out, variables. So if I have million variables, so I I'm gonna have hundreds of millions of observations. So the data set is going to be super big, okay? And what if we put in the loss function? What if we have, oh, this is a very good one actually. I have two minutes, so this is important. One. I think this was, Tristan, this is your question. Uh, what if we put uh, in loss function? So in the loss function, the penalty term, uh, we, are, we are adding the weights, not the coefficients, uh, not, not the variables, right? Remember, if I use L1, I'm, I'm adding this one. If I use L2 in the loss function, in the penalty part, I'm adding WJ to the power of two. So there is no sign of X. You don't have to do anything with X's, right? But what if the X's are dummy variables? This is a really good question. So basically he's saying that, what if I have a dummy variable? Let's say I, I'm adding, uh, it, the dummy variables are the week of the day. Sorry, days of the week, right? So I have the, let's, let's, use, let's use B plus W1. Then I can have Monday plus Tuesday, W2 Tuesday plus et cetera, W Monday, Tuesday, well, six, let's say Saturday. And I will not put the Sunday in the model, right? Does everyone understand? So this is dummy variable, you have to drop one of them. So that, that thing that you're dropping is going to be your base one. Now, if I use lasso, what will happen? What if lasso get rid of Saturday and Tuesday, but the Monday is still in the model? What's wrong with that? Basically, the less, what Lasso is doing is that is, let's say I have six, six dummy variable in the model and it's getting rid of one of them or two of them or three of them. It's a bad thing. It's completely ruined the interpretation, right? Remember the interpretation was, we said that uh, what is the effect of, uh, let's say Monday on stock market return compared to what? Compared to the benchmark. But what if, you're dropping all of them from the model. Now the benchmark is completely changed, right? So in Lasso, uh, there are actually the, there are more advanced ways to do that. Um, uh, basically, it's called group. I think group Lasso, or something like that. I think I had it somewhere. There, there are some models that will. Let me see. I had it somewhere. Yeah, there are modified group Lasso. So modified group lasso that can take care of this one. But the idea is that if you have two classes, that's fine. If it is male, female, that's fine. Because you only have one feature in the model, right? So maybe X1 is male or female. So the lasso is going to either completely get rid of it or just keep it in the model and the interpretation doesn't change. But if you have multiple classes, you have to group them together. Let's say uh, Monday versus everything else, Tuesday versus everything else and et cetera, and then use lasso. 
What about ridge regression? Do I, do I need to be worried about ridge regression if I have domain variables? No, because ridge will never drop variables from the model. Does that make sense? All right, very good question. I really actually enjoyed all the questions. And I think we have two questions from the chat. I think the video explained it, but what role was taking the absolute value of W for less? So uh, Jennifer, I hope that I answered this one. Sorry, I couldn't take it in real time. Thank you for calling this my internet question. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. And uh, next class, next Monday, we are gonna do all these things in Python. And uh, then we will see that maybe ridge lasso or elastic net is not as fancy or as useful as you're thinking right now. <laughs> it comes with a challenge, right? Sometimes linear regression is going to do a better job. Yeah, and actually your homework is basically some, one of those examples. Yep. Yeah, I was just gonna ask about the homework. So uh, my group for the June is probably two the questions we wanted. And it seemed like we had covered some of the uh, topics. 